Kat and Agnes. Welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you here. Hello for having us. <laughs> I'd like to take a moment to have you each introduce yourselves to us so we can get a little bit of, about who each of you are. I am a painter outside of writing. I love to do that to relax. And I'm a big history buff as well. I love going to museums and visiting old houses and all things gothic. I'm a psychologist. Technically, never worked in the job. <laughs> but uh, yeah, in my free time, I like reading. I love movies. I wanted to be a film director when I was younger, before I started writing. And I love gaming. And I'm mostly focused on story-based games because that's what I like the most. Fantastic. Between the history and the psychology, <laughs> that just kind of puts so much into perspective on things you could just throw into books. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because yes. of your, your, your likes. And your... We love researching not just historical events as in political events, but how, what was the social history mm -hmm. of and, and reading people's journals, re reading the letters they sent to each other. You can really get a feel of how people connected differently psychologically mm -hmm. than in we nowadays. Have, yeah. We have many books about social history. Yeah. <laughs> we haven't read them all, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to get a little history on the two of you before we get into some of the books you've put mm -hmm. out this year. How did you two come together to make this writing duo that we've come to know as K.A. American? Well, basically, we, we were from different cities in Poland, because that's where we are originally from. But we tended to be in the same kind of hobbies and circles, queer circles as well. And we kind of kept meeting up on various mailing lists, forums. And at some point, she organized a meetup. And I went with some of my friends there, and that's how we properly met. But we actually started becoming friends oh, and that, working I think together. That was a yeah. meet up in my garage. Yes, we were, we were in that garage. <laughs> so yeah, my parents now. were really yeah. uh, encouraging of, of us meeting my friends. So mm -hmm. they were very smart about that. <laughs> yeah, but we, we met, but we didn't actually become close friends for a while until we were at, at this party and we started talking about writing yes. basically, uh, because we both preferred writing of another person and we both had problems with our co-writers and we started discussing uh, what we would like Ranting. to do <laughs> and uh, yeah by the by the end of the night because it was a new year's party so by the time we actually went to sleep at 4 or 5 a.m we had something plotted out yeah that we, had, was... we had an idea for what we wanted to write together we both went to our respective homes mm -hmm. and the next day we started writing and from there it, it was 2006 yeah. i think yeah we started That's writing amazing. together and first we wrote on on just like mailing each other mm -hmm. and then after a while we start off started a blog where people could read them by chapter mm -hmm. that kind of original mm -hmm. fiction and we covered lots of people being encouraging and commenting and everything mm -hmm. so we kind of really went with that and continued and continued until we decided we wanted to make it a career yeah yeah also her sister wanted to encourage us to publish yeah. something in english because we used to write in Polish, and she basically bet us uh, that she will pay for editing uh, of our first story if we write a story within a certain time frame, and we did. So that was a challenge that actually uh, moved, motivated, motivated us. Yeah. us mm -hmm. Yes, that's awesome that you had a family member who yeah, you know, believed in the stories great. that much to push you to you know start writing in english and was even willing to like pay for the editing and stuff that's yes. awesome yeah mm -hmm. she was very she, she is great she's still I mean, supporting yeah, us she does our website yeah <laughs> so she's still involved too even better well, yes, yes, yes 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 she also writes she doesn't do the same kind of fiction she does fantasy stories uh, but she is very involved uh, in, in writing and interested in the process so we keep talking about it uh, just between ourselves till this day. It's wonderful to hear that the partnership has gone on for 15 plus years now. Mm -hmm. We actually live together now yeah. and we have a cat together and it's just great. Yeah. <laughs> Makes it easy to write, I guess, when you're in the it same does. place. We have a little office together mm. in the living room. It's really nice. Yeah. Mm. How has the partnership evolved in those years? So we we started out uh, living in different cities when we when we first became friends and started working together. But then she moved and to, to England to to pursue university studies. 
I was still in Poland and we decided when we started publishing, we decided to start a company in Britain. So I came here after I finished my master's degree and got a driver's license finally. <laughs> so yeah, that's when we started living together and we just became closer and it is yeah. just so much fun uh, living together mm. that we might as well that yeah. kind of thing there's this pressure mm. that i've always had that it's the natural thing to do you grow up and then you get a flat of your own and you know you move on to that but you know why it's why not nice. why not do things your own way and mm. if i'm having so much fun it's basically like a, a 24 hour sleepover forever <laughs> you know it's just <laughs> so much fun to live with Aga and we we share chores yeah. uh, she does the DIY Ikea I cook for her so you know it's fun <laughs> not only a great partnership in writing but a great partnership in living together yes yes we are platonic life partners yes yes <laughs> What brought you as you were deciding what to write and keeping in the in the genre for so long with romance and MM romance? So we already wrote MM romance fiction as I we think, met. I before we discovered mm -hmm. romance as a genre yes. that neither of us kind of knew before. We did That's a lot true. of fan fiction, original fiction, mm. and we, we did lots of gay oriented fiction, but we didn't do romance. We didn't That's understand true romance being a central love story and a happy ending so we wrote fiction that was all sorts of out of the box that was about relationships but only once we switched to english and did the market research we're like look look there's this whole genre and it's and it's romance and people love it and maybe this is like the thing that we could be doing and we could then focus on that and see how it really works for what we're already doing and it really streamlined uh, our style, yeah. Let's talk about some of the books you've put out this year because mm -hmm. you've had quite a prolific year and we're only like halfway through the year. I feel it's point. never enough. I feel yeah. it's, oh, it's been such a slow year. <laughs> oh no, just de this and that. There is yeah. always this angst that we are not doing enough. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> Your 11th book, in the Guns and Boys series yeah. is coming out in July. For those who don't know this series, before we talk about the new book, tell us a little bit about Guns and Boys. It's our longest running series. It's such a passion we, project. We still right? started it in Polish and then we wrote it a bit differently. The first kind of books, let's say. We, we thought we'd translate it, yes, but we it ended up rewriting no. it because yes. it needed... Uh, but the story is it, it's about two men who are members of the mafia the italian mafia and uh, one of them is the boss's son who doesn't really want to get involved and uh, the other one is assassin a, a very uh, prolific one and uh, <laughs> he's an extremely toxic person and things happen and they end up uh, having to run from the organization and the whole story throughout the books is them on the run and the relationship Develop, yeah, developing. The, because... Developing the relationship and going through the motions of certain issues in each book, there's like a new thing that challenges their relationship. So it's not like they get together in book one and then it's all mm. just fighting the outside world. Each book has a lot of internal conflict all the way as they build the relationship. Mm. So it's something really special to us because you rarely get so much time with one couple mm. to really, really put them mm. through the ringer. And from the start, the story is very dark. There's a lot of toxicity in the relationship. There's violence, there's things like that. And having a very long story allows us to unpack it years later because their relationship throughout the 11 books is seven years. So we can get through, both of them have all sorts of internal yeah. toxic masculinity issues, internalized homophobia as well. And they, what they do to each other in these first books needs to be unpacked later on as they grow as people and grow in their relationship. But what I find also interesting is that they, they work through it, but they can't take it back. Mm -hmm. There is no way to take back what, what happened. They can only work through it if they want to stay together. And I find that a fascinating story that you can have a relationship that keeps growing into something new throughout the years that isn't just the same with a new outside issue. Mm -hmm. It's also very pulpy. So 
when we started writing it, we just wanted it to be like this crazy pulpy story straight from, let's say, Quentin Tarantino's movies. So some really weird stuff happens so, so there. It's a, so, so it's a conscious choice that yes. a lot of it is unrealistic. Yes. There's, there's a wrestling and alligator. There's drug lords with a golden tank. There's these, these really, uh, like, I, I see it like a movie. And even mm. though the characters have a lot of internal logic and true psychology, the events are crazy and wild and they you know have shootouts in a butcher shop you know all sorts of stuff that really gives the story its own style because mm. we like to give a series its own vibe so yeah. like we have a series a, a, a one book that is like, very dark and noir while we have another like the biker series is wild and crazy but in a bit of a more realistic way mm. than guns and boys and you know we, we really like to give each series its own thing and this one is just crazy it's just wild the characters do crazy shit and we pull no punches we don't often see single relationships spread across yeah. this mm -hmm. many books. It happens in trilogies a lot where you know you're going to follow this character and they're going to end up with their HEA at the end of the trilogy. Mm -hmm. I've seen some that have gone on for six-ish books before folks really get settled. And those are tight timeline books too. Mm -hmm. Whereas you're talking about 11 yes. books in a seven-year mm -hmm. timeline. Yes. What are the challenges in subverting expectations a little bit where, you know, each book in a series is a different couple or things like mm -hmm. that, as you continue to spread the story out. It's complicated. It's always, whenever we were supposed to write a new Guns and Boys book, there was this tension because you need to remember everything that happened in all those previous books. And then you still make mistakes and you notice them when you re-edit re and you have to change things up. So <laughs> it, it, it's, it has lots of challenges. But also every time you need to think about another way to challenge the characters and the relationships so that it doesn't feel stale. Because obviously you, you can have, say, a series about two guys who, I don't know, solve crimes and they are in a relationship throughout. But then the story is focused on the crimes. Not whereas, on the romantic tension. Yes. Yeah. And we wanted to keep them changing because they've been such terrible people at the <laughs> beginning, especially one of them. That That's the story. Yes. That's him, his growth yes. and the other characters' growth with him mm. is, is just the fascinating bit. And each, each book kind of builds on that. Yes. But we could just do it gradually this sadly, way. Sadly, there's also the challenge that with each book in an 11 series series the sales fall off and it's mm. really hard and really heartbreaking because you know the story needs to go on for this or that reason and it has these diehard fans who really get you but then you understand that a lot of people will kind of get to book three and drift off and never come back to the series so it's really hard at book 11 when it's all wrapping up to have the same amount of people reading it and that's that's i think one of the toughest things because it's such a passion project for, for us to have this series done yeah is 11 going to be the end or is there still more no yes uh, it's that's that's the end we uh, we kind of had even more ideas <laughs> the craziness like landing on a deserted island things like that. <laughs> um and it would fit into the series but we decided that, that and one of the reasons why is that we we didn't want to part from the characters. But we, and in the end, decided that there is no point in prolonging the series because we want to give... Looking at the plot, yes. we saw that. Yes, that's what it would be too indulgent. And, and we just wanted to keep the story good so that every book really has... An intense storyline. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, so that it's not watered down. And I, I think 11 is a good number for those two. <laughs> They had a lot of issues to yes. work through, but it's incredibly satisfying when you get mm. to this from this tumultuous relationship and they go through lots of terrible things throughout the years to get them to this last book. And you still have all sorts of conflict, but they work together and mm. to see them finally work together and do things like consult each other, not like in the past when one of them would just do whatever they think they is right and lie to the other and things like that or do stuff behind their back. It's really nice to see them work together, understand each other or sometimes without words because they have so much history and it's the history that the reader has seen. And that's, that's I think, 
so different than showing, okay, I'm going to write about an established couple and I'm going to tell you what they've done in the last mm -hmm. 20 years. To actually mm -hmm. be there as it happened, it's an emotional experience that you go through with the characters that cannot happen unless you've been through so much uh, with them. Yeah. Congratulations on wrapping up something that has I'm gone really on proud of it. Thank for you. so yeah. long. Yes. Did you know it was going to be 11 so that you no. kind of knew where the stop <laughs> no. point was? No. <laughs> That's amazing. We had an end goal plot wise we have mm -hmm. certain things that are set that, that's another fun thing you can set up things in book one book two that only get revealed yes. in book nine and i i instantly anticipate that the readers will go like oh no i've seen it mm. it's gonna I, I saw it come i could never really imagine yes. how and it's is, gonna go yeah there's also this the biggest villain of the series who appears in book one and then he doesn't really appear in person. Sometimes person, he is but, mentioned. But he meddles, yes. he's throughout, he, yes. he's here, he's there. It's like an ongoing thread through all those 11 books. And the, the things he did to the main characters, they resonate throughout all of the books. So he is there in, like not presence. in person, yeah. uh, he is there in spirit, let's <laughs> say. <laughs> And I think it will be incredibly um, rewarding to, for the readers of the series to see him be how there again and with, how it's yeah. dealt with exactly so yeah yeah you mentioned a couple times that this was your passion project mm -hmm. what made it that i mean obviously we are passionate about all our books but there are some that are more special than others and i think one of the reasons why this is true for guns and boys is because we truly live through those characters. I mean, we are very normal people in the sense that, we, you know, we, we like to, to have a chat, go, go on a walk, cafe. go to the cafe, and we, we don't flirt with danger in real life. So this story, we can live vicariously through all those crazy things that those characters do. And because this is so long, I truly feel like, for example, Domenico, the main character is almost my alter ego, my evil alter ego. Yes. Uh, if I'm hungry, I'm making him eat sweets, for example, or if I'm angry, I will make him more angry when I write. So I, I have, I feel I have a very special relationship with this character. I think there's also this very special element that this is uh, the second story we ever wrote together. Mm. And we, we started it in Polish and then we got to rework it. So it's one of the stories that uh, has been with us the longest. And mm -hmm. I think that makes it very special too. Not just that it's the longest we've written as a series, but because we started it so long ago. Mm -hmm. And I go, uh, we got to have so many adventures with these characters, yes. even though some of it that's been written in Polish has been changed so much we've had even more time with them because mm. we've written so much of it before we mm. even got to publish them in English. We even have lots of our marketing material based on this uh, series. So we, we have this oh, I can show you. lemon. That's actually, yeah, that's them. <laughs> we have this. Oh, that's awesome. And that's kind of the happy ending where they are back in Italy. Yeah, the symbol of the relationship is a lemon because love is sour for yeah. those two and yeah we we use lemons ev everywhere it, yeah. we are kind of obsessed a little trademark yes. there, yeah. <laughs> and i also think that with these characters we really let our freak flag mm. fly yes. <laughs> we let them be as crazy as they want and we don't worry much about what will the romance crowd say no they just they do what I yes. think is right, and that's it. <laughs> it's rare that writing a character doesn't involve, in the moment, that much analyzing. But with those two, we know them so well that yes. we don't have to plan out what they're going to do, because it's, we have a plan for the scene, but the, how it happens, happens organically. And so often it changes, mm. because these characters, they they speak, speak to us so organically mm -hmm. uh, that they will often, it almost feels like they're changing the scene, the direction mm -hmm. of it because they are so ingrained in us, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Kat, did you paint that? No, no, <laughs> it's actually a funny story because I got, I got it for me for my birthday. Uh, it's gorgeous <laughs> and it sits right there so well. So. Yes, it's, it's, really, it's really fun to look at it every day, yeah. yeah. Now, vastly different from Guns yeah. and Boys, you released Take My Body earlier this year, and that's mm -hmm. the second book in 
the Cursebound series. Mm-hmm. Tell us about Caspian and Gunner, just to totally move in a different direction. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's a body swap romance, and those two characters, they are each other. They are opposites, basically. One of them is big and this harsh guy. Involved not in gang. Involved yeah. in gang activity, not well off. And the other one is from a, a nice family of lawyers who, well, he has lots of issues because he doesn't feel masculine enough. So he feels like he is lacking, let's say, muscle mass, height, because she's she, she, short. And yeah, they have those opposite issues because Gunner, on the other hand, the big guy, he feels like he can't be himself in the body he has also. So, and also there's the issue that Gunner used to bully Caspian when they were in high school. Yeah, so <laughs> because they were both trying to fulfill yes. society's expectations yes. of them. And this was a very interesting book to write because mm. of it, because it focuses on challenging those expectations. Mm. It's almost, you know, obvious that it's going to go there, that walk a mile in my shoes. And when they do, they find out that masculinity isn't made in muscles mm. and that it isn't uh, being violent and that there's so many other things that can be explored. And then Gunner finds out that, well, he doesn't need a small body to feel sensitive and mm. to show his vulnerability to others. And we, we get to explore that. I won't obviously spoil how it ends because <laughs> you might be surprised. I, we like to twist things up. Yeah. But that was very interesting to explore how someone can possibly get their perfect body but then it's not really what they mm. thought it's going to be. Mm. And it provides so many new challenges that they didn't expect. And the grass isn't always greener on the other side. Yeah. It's, and it's those are typical movie. themes that we've seen in so many body swap movies. Yeah. You know, yes. that it's not always what you think it's going to be and yeah. everything like that. Yeah. I this sounds that. like you're going a lot deeper there. And I can imagine, you know, this is where the psychology angle kind of comes in really well as yes, you're digging yeah, into yeah. these to these mm-hmm. matters. Really explore that. Mm-hmm. See, actually, it's a funny story because I have a very strange experience writing this book because I uh, I recently came out as non-binary. And one of the ways in, in which I kind of came to this conclusion was by writing this book because I was focusing so much about on this character not being in sync with how people perceive him that I I kind of started thinking more about how I feel and why I have some dysphorias in my life always had them so yeah it was a very important book for me to write and uh, I think we really managed to go deep also because of that because it was so in sync with what was going on in my life when we were writing it and how the outside doesn't always match the inside, mm. but it can be more vague than the obvious that there's a different size and then you might have a personality that's, let's say, loud. But this is much more dealing with this, how society perceives you on that. Mm-hmm. Because you might think, great, I have this loud personality. I don't mind if I'm mm-hmm. small, but people will still yes. perceive you in a certain way. It's it's tough how and how these characters can deal with it. It was a very interesting mm. uh, journey. Yeah. And it's interesting to hear these differences between like guns and boys where you've given them such an over the top kind of yeah. experience. <laughs> and as you noted, things that just don't fit to your lives at all because you're not living in a Tarantino yes. movie. Yes. But then you come to Take My Body where then it does hit much closer to home and even mm-hmm. helps you sort things out as you write it. Yes, uh, almost. That scary, sounds really. wildly yeah, satisfying yeah. as a writer to have those kind of two yeah. sides of things. Mm-hmm. I mean, every time when when you write characters, at least for us, there needs to be a part of you in them because otherwise it feels artificial to me. I mean, I can write say fan fiction or something like that, but if it, if it's not a character that I can truly feel uh, what they're feeling, what what their personality is, how it's built. Yes. It, but there's it's always different. something that you connect with yes. and latch on yes. with the character. And, yeah. and, and kind of, well, not project you on the character necessarily, but you need to kind of simulate the character inside of you. It's I find that very fascinating yes. that when I'm in sync with the character, when I'm writing and I'm mm-hmm. in the zone, 
I can be writing with about a fetish that isn't mine at all mm -hmm. but i'm in the zone and i channel it and mm -hmm. all of a sudden i can really see why this a character finds something attractive or how they go through that situation psychologically and that's that's a really exciting experience yeah so to change genres again <laughs> <laughs> you put a duology out this year called Dig Two Graves, yes. uh, which is set in the Old West. <laughs> Another passion project. <laughs> Another passion project. What yeah. sent you into the Old West and what made this one a passion so, project? We always used to think the Wild West is boring. So that's and that's, dusty. Yes, and dusty, and we didn't get it. And whenever I thought Wild West, I thought about the old movies that my dad was watching and they kind of felt stodgy to me and I didn't think it was interesting. But then we, we I mean, we saw Red Dead Redemption, the, the, the game, the Red Dead Redemption 2, and we decided to buy the game and start playing games because Basically it looked so because exciting. Of it. Yes. And it looked like it had an amazing story. And we generally thought that maybe by not gaming, mm -hmm. we are missing out on, 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 a, good storytelling. on good storytelling, yes. on a different way of storytelling. And that that's really interesting for us because it's not just books. We read, a uh, we watch a lot of movies and we thought like, but these games are so good now. Yes. Like, what what is it about them? I need to check out. And yeah, we literally bought a PlayStation to play uh, Red Dead Redemption Two. And the moment we opened it, we were enchanted. It yeah. was just like I was. I remember I had the 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 console first, and she was sitting next to me, and I was like, "Look, look, it's like a movie, but I'm in it." <laughs> and it was just so much, so much fun. And the world is so immersive, and yes. all of a sudden everything clicked yes. and the wild west the way it's presented in red dead redemption and the themes that the wild west world can convey really resonated with us yes and we we finally got what it was about and then we started being interested in it so we started watching a movie but we uh, knew that we have other projects so yes. we should be doing this. <laughs> this is maybe one day we'll write a Western. Maybe. maybe one day. Yes. And it was always on the back burner, always like, yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get there. <laughs> yeah, and we kind of put it on the back burner for I think two, two years, years yeah. or something like that. Uh, but we actually started, uh, you know, reading on about about this time period and watching movies that turned out to be actually very good. Some of them, especially the modern ones. Yes, there's a lot of new movies much. that challenge the typical Western by including characters that aren't the usual masculine kind of cowboy. You have a lot of female protagonists nowadays in a lot of Westerns. They go into new types of comedy. They challenge how the uh, world looked back there. And that, that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. Yes. At some point, I was visiting my parents and I played another game. And when I was playing it, I, I had this idea for a plot suddenly, and I, I called her on the phone and uh, <laughs> we talked for, I think, an hour and a half about it. And I was trying to convince her that maybe we should write this question now. No, 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 we can't. <laughs> let's make this plot contemporary. Let's make this, let's, okay, let's do it, but let's make it this or that or a dystopian or something. It, it, and with the more we talked about it, we could see how there's no way to write the story without the setting and which is hmm. the best for a historical or any book that has a specific setting. It has to have a reason to be there. If it could be placed wherever, it's kind of why is it even a hmm. Western? But because the story has all these Western themes of revenge and redemption and uh, we include also like pulpy things like cannibalism in the woods and things like that. <laughs> and shootouts and gangs and ra rail robberies you know those mm. kind of things that are so typical for the western that it just had to be a western mm. yeah it was a very interesting process we never did as much research for a book as we did oh, for those. it was it was crazy yeah. we we took a month just for research and that's why i'm saying it's a passion project because you don't know how it's going to sell, yeah. but you still do it. Because Especially, you have to. <laughs> we, we, we do have some historical books, but we are not specializing in it. So we're not the kind of writer where everyone will know, Expect, oh, this person is, yeah. is going to do a Western, and that's why I get their books. So yeah, we basically research full time for eight, nine, ten hours a day, every day. And that was our month. It was a lot of fun. 
<laughs> but also, I think uh, the good thing about it going with our brand as hmm. sorts is that even though it's a, a historical novel, it's absolutely it's gritty, it's dark, hmm. it's got gang violence, the characters are criminals. I feel like it, we did manage to draw in all our usual audience hmm. and we're extremely proud of those books because hmm. they are just so dramatic and so... And again, the relationship spans seven years okay. in, in these two <laughs> books. Oh. So it's it's been it's it, it takes you on an amazing journey with these characters. I I won't lie, I'm really happy when people tell tell me they cried. <laughs> Reading <laughs> mission accomplished. Yes, mission accomplished. <laughs> tell us a little bit about the characters that we find in, in Dig Two Graves and whatever you can hint about the journey that they're actually going on. So the main character, because the there is two books and each one is a single POV. So the first one is from the one character's POV and the other from the second character's POV. And the main character and the POV character of the first book is Ned, who is, well, a he, farm he, boy. he is a farm boy <laughs> at his uncle's farm uh, or ranch. And uh, he gets this ultimatum that he has has to leave for reasons and he happens to meet this guy uh, when he goes to get drunk and gamble because he's so angry money, yeah. <laughs> lost of his money and uh, the guy is cold and yeah they hit it off they, they they have great chemistry let's say he has no idea that he's interested in a man he is completely and that's the fun thing yes. that had to be a western because we researched so much about the sexuality in those mm. times and the psychology of how people connected with each other. Mm. And for him, it made sense. Uh, that's why it had to be at least a historical because mm. it made sense for him to live his life and not really understand or be aware that he even had an option of a different sexuality. Mm -hmm. And nowadays, you know, he'd go on the internet and <laughs> he'd find things. Or so he'll yeah. be aware that this happens. Yes. Oh, yes. At least that. Even if yes. he thought, no, not me, he'd be aware of this. Let us have a very slow growth of a character getting to know himself. But the main theme there is that years ago, Ned's parents were uh, murdered by a gang in the mountains when he was a child. He saw some terrible things, more terrible things happened, and that's how he ended up at his uncle's. And then when he meets Cole, it turns out that Cole, Cole is the mem a member of the same gang. So the gang is still roaming, he mm. can still find them, because, you know, the country was really big, so he kind of just thought he'd never see mm. them or find them again when he grew up. And then he is approached by two Pinkertons to go undercover in the gang to help them bring out, bring down the gang. And they know he has a personal stake in it, so they think this is a great person to have him there. So you got the undercover trope and he goes in to the gang where he is very much invited by Cole because Cole knows what he wants. He just doesn't isn't really good at communicating it because he's not sure of Ned and it takes forever for them to kind of go around. That's why it's fun to have only one POV because you don't get to know what Cole exactly. is thinking, thinking and yeah. you're in Ned's head who thinks like, oh, this is just friendly cowboys being friendly. <laughs> so it, it's just uh, really fun. It was, I think it was the first book in a very long time that we wrote in only one POV mm -hmm. because we usually do dual POV. And that was really fun. It's really inspired us to do uh, more of that. But for the Western element, it was so exciting to just put them in this wilderness and mm -hmm. put Ned, this innocent guy, on a journey. But also, obviously, of a fall as a moral failure because he is undercover but he cannot he, he can't keep his hands clean if he's within this gang so mm -hmm. he will do things that he doesn't want to do and keep excusing himself yes. because it's for the higher purpose and step um, by step you get to be with him and i cannot spoil it so i won't say how it goes in the first book but you do you know have this descent and it's never something that he wants to do but you don't he doesn't even notice how he ends up in the place he does at the end of the mm -hmm. book and everything is broken yeah and cole is well it's this charming character who is an anti-hero essentially he he is not one of the guys who killed his parents yeah. but he, he was a child back then yes and the connection that they have that he doesn't even know about and i'm saying this because this is in the first chapters he uh, <laughs> he when the gang was attacking his family 
he was still a child. He came around to bring them things from a pantry where Ned was hiding and they met each other's eyes. No one said anything. And he didn't tell the gang that there was someone else in the house. And he rem and Ned remembered that, so he the, has this visceral connection with this mm. man, and he remembers his eyes, and it's always very romantic. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> he's a bit crazy yeah. and uh, very extravagant, wild. wild. <laughs> so they have very different personalities, yeah. and yeah, things develop very slowly. But I, I think it's very satisfying in the end yeah. to see a progress of characters. Yeah. You run across so many subgenres. Just in this interview, we've talked about some contemporary, paranormal, gritty, yeah, and paranormal, Western. and Western, <laughs> old West, not just Western, but old yes, West. Yes, yeah. There's all there's a lot of focus in that dark, kind of dirty, kind of yeah. dangerous area. What mm -hmm. attracts you to that side to write so many of the stories? I think it's the same as the same what attracts people to horror. So you want to experience danger from the safety uh -huh. of your sofa <laughs> or from the seat, safety of the seat in the cinema. And it's, I think it's the same thing because I I get very excited when I read or, or watch or write scenes that are very dangerous, very brutal, very visceral. But this is something I don't ever want to have anything to do with. So it's a way for me to get this excitement without actually being involved. I, I just, it relaxes me. I, I am never relaxed by say fluffy books. I, 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 I just don't get them very much, let's say. I think maybe when people have a stressful day Probably, as yes. a surgeon and they come back home yes. and they just want to chill, maybe they want to, you know, tone down mm. the level of their adrenaline, but for, for me, us, this yeah, is this is this is extremely mm. it's it's exciting, like watching a like a roller coaster. Yes, and uh, I think there's also the element of exploring those that psychological dark side and how you can twist things around. How how a relationship can even like Guns and Boys, like how can it go from terrible to something that grows and still makes sense because. Sometimes I will read books that are dark romances that just are, you know, torturous and terrible. And I don't really get that psychological understanding of how these characters and when did that switch happen? Sometimes it's too quickly. And I like prolonging it and seeing how the characters grow. Again, just like in the Western, that you don't even understand when, but it's happened. And they are on a different level. You put them through different challenges together and it's it's fascinating to see oh i know like you put them in extreme situations again people in extreme situations are very interesting to watch yeah, they <laughs> so, do yeah. things sometimes. and they will do things that you will not get to see in a contemporary because they're just nice normal people why would they do xyz mm. but if you put people in a in extreme situations like someone witnessing a murder or getting you know shot at they will have to change their life completely and how they react tells you everything about that person even if they do something they regret that will also tell you something about them and just delving into that psychology of characters in dark situations i find it super exciting and mm. fun yeah you do flip over to sweeter stories Sometimes. <laughs> what changes for you to end up and tell a sweeter story? Is it to give yourselves a break or because there's a certain <laughs> thing that only needs to be told as a sweeter yeah, story? Yes. A lot of the time, those darker books are intense. intense. So we are sometimes tired uh, and need a palate cleanser, let's say. And usually we end up going with something that's comedy. And usually when... A when the story is sweet, the characters need to be freaks in bed or yes, something like that. Like the, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. something, something strange must still be happening. I mean, strange. Let's say out, out of the ordinary. ordinary must be still happening because otherwise I it wouldn't be something I want to write. But uh, yeah, sometimes we just want to write a wacky story that's a bit lighter in tone. I think wacky is the right word yes. for it. Like if it's not dark, it has to have some other crazy stuff going on. Like we have this one uh, called a uh, hipster brothel and it's about a guy who just came out of a relationship and it's basically 
quite a fluffy story of friends to lovers because he has a, a friend who's been hanging out with him and basically his ex dumped him because like he was saying you're hanging out with this guy too much and I, I just can't be the, the third wheel in your friendship, whatever this might be. And he decides to, to prove to his ex that well, he's, adventurous. He, he's adventurous, he can be crazy, he, he's not boring, why would he be dumped like this? And he decides to start unique, one-of-a-kind experience where he will basically sell himself for a lumberjack experience where you come over and to, to his like wagon in the woods because he's a total hipster. It's like, that's the kind of- And it makes no sense. It makes no sense. Yeah. And, because, and he makes so many mistakes because the idea is bad he's very cute and very emotional he's this big guy and uh, his friend uh, loves him being sweet and he is trying to put himself in this position where he will prove that he can be wild and crazy and yeah, he, he doesn't need feelings yes yeah. <laughs> and uh, that uh, writing that whole element of inputting all those hipster things in in, in the book like the the lumber sexual experience and that he loves matcha donuts and things like and makes his own jams and things like that that that's like the fun element of that there's nothing dark about this book but it's it's crazy because the characters do extreme things i think again even though they're kind of regular citizen they are trying to do something that is out of the norm and that really pushes them outside and makes them interesting to us. I think we also write about a lot of types like uh, punks or rebels or goth characters. And that comes from us being not like in the alternative scene in one way or another. Mm -hmm and having those experiences from like our teenage years as well mm -hmm. so we best connect with rebels of all sorts and i think that comes across in the funnier books as well i love how you take <laughs> that sweeter is not even the right word it's more like no. wacky, like you said yes. <laughs> yeah, you've written across so many genres is there some genre that you want to dive into yet that you haven't quite figured out the right situation yes, for? Yes. <laughs> yes, we, we want to write a book about vampires. So that's, we've talked about it for a long time, but there never has been a good um, enough project, let's say. And um, now we're kind of thinking yes. that next year should, because we're going to be done with Canton Boys. We have another upcoming series later this year. And after that, I think I think vampires might be next. Mm. But I was gonna say fantasy, and also fantasy, uh, because yes. I I've uh, we've been building a world based on some games we played in the past with friends, and then building it up on our own ideas. And we want to write about orcs and have this dark, dangerous fantasy world that is not YA, that is full on an adult book, and set in this whole dark fantasy world. Uh, and another world so it's not like a paranormal but proper mm. other world fantasy and it keeps going on the back burner yeah. sadly but maybe next we also, year as well we don't want to release just one book we want yes. to make it more of a world so we need at least two three so that it makes sense no, it has to at least be yes. a trilogy to start with and then then we can go from there mm. but just one book so two, we need to have more yeah. time yes to deal with. yeah Oh, the world building and stuff. Yeah. But the world building is going on in the background. Yes, that's true. So I'm kind of happy that hopefully by the time we get there to actually write, we'll have all these ideas and stuff for the world written down. We already have a plot for the first book already written down that we have to put on the back burner. A year ago. But I really hope that it's also tricky because fantasy technically sells less so it's hard it's another passion project that might be amazing but might just be a passion project and not earn much and we still have to pay rent so right. it's it's tough mm -hmm. when you have to choose between two things you love when you know one will technically surely be a success while the other no matter how much more or less hard you put in it it might not succeed so we are gonna do it but we need to just wait for a right moment for it but it's gonna happen yeah because we just follow our passion, yeah. I love talking to co-writers because there's so many different ways that people yeah. mm -hmm. co-write. I'd love to know a little bit about your process. You know, things like, do you plot out a bunch of stuff or is there a lot of discovery writing? And really how you split up the writing too between the mm -hmm. both of you. 
So it's usually we, we start with an idea and uh, then once we have an idea, we plan the character. Like so a basic character concept. concept or like a theme concept. Yes. Yeah. So that we have an idea of what the basic conflict will be in the book at first. And we do a lot of planning beforehand. We are definitely plotters. Uh, plotters yes. So we have all kinds of tables that we fill out <laughs> that later help yeah, us yeah. with keeping the mood and the themes of, of the book consistent throughout that we don't forget about them and then have to <laughs> add it retroactively. Everything informs us in planning the scenes. It especially makes sense when we write together, we need to both know where the scene yes. is going. Otherwise we're meandering. Mm. So it, it, even if there's lots of improvisation when we actually write, we need to know the main uh, goal of the character, what his conflict is for the scene and what his choice is. We really try to make things exciting by always mm -hmm. giving characters a problem and each scene will make him move him forward in the story, in the relationship, in the plot. And it was always it will always be based on his choices. We don't mm -hmm. like to throw characters who flow where it takes them and go here and there. No, they need to be the protagonist. So they need mm -hmm. to choose and they need to move the story. And we usually, even though we decide on things together and plot it together, we do share the main characters mostly by one writing mostly one of them and the other writing the other. So that, uh, especially in dialogue, it's extremely fluid and mm -hmm. we can write very fast when we actually sit down to write. Mm -hmm. And usually we do it like that, that we decide all of the, of all of this on all of this together. Then when we sit down to write the scene, we, we write together in one file and then we know where a scene is going. We know the setting, we know the general, that's like two paragraphs when we look at our like plans. And from there, we, we just write the scene together. And if we need to communicate something, oh, I think he should like mm. go, go here, or I think it should be daytime or nighttime, we're just gonna talk about it in our little office as we write on different computers, but in one file. And usually we write a paragraph or two and then move on to the other person. Yes, and uh, it depends on the scene. For example, for fight scenes, and we have a lot of those, we have a very strict choreography written down so that we don't pull in different directions and. Add because you can't be guessing what the other person yes. wants to do. Yeah. Yes, we, we try to do that. And, and especially, that especially for fight scenes, you really need to plan what's going to happen. It needs to be exciting. Mm -hmm. it, there needs to be tension. If it's just one person shoots, the other shoots, it, yeah. it just isn't. Uh, <laughs> and yeah, I guess and also another thing that even though we plan, we often actually change the plan throughout it, it's not set in stone so usually we have an idea of where we're going so it's rare that the ending changes the the sometimes it does but usually it stays happens, the same yeah. usually it stays the same but we usually as we try to have new ideas so we include those and try to work it into the plan so that it still makes sense sometimes we'll go for a walk if we're mm. stuck and that's the nice thing about living together that we mm. could just get to go out together and we mm -hmm. go on a walk and, it, and we, st we, st we can still think about it as working mm. <laughs> because we're talking about the book and its problems and especially if we're stuck in a scene and then we can oftentimes come up with whole new ideas that take us in a new direction it's rarely like if we if we argue about where a scene should go it's rarely deciding on one or the other we usually come up with a third option mm. that suits us more and uh, i would say we have a very good partnership in creative mm. work we very rarely argue about something i think because we both want to make it work mm. it's obvious to us that we cannot write something that doesn't work for either of us we need to always be happy with the end mm. book because it's our book so they can they can they cannot be lack of communication so we can be very crude to mm. each other and it's allowed because or leave like really mm. mean comments in the edits like an editor would never leave me a comment like i leave to her or she to me because it's understood that this is all for the better of the mm. text and for the better of the story and so anything goes nothing should be pulled back and then held as a grudge i think this ultimate honesty that we have uh, when writing serves the stories and makes the partnership so good mm. how do you think your writing partnership has changed over the years 
things that you were doing back then that you're not doing or you've added to process since then? I mean, obviously things changed because of the way we changed into writing as a hobby to just doing it more professionally. Also, we used to just write spontaneously, let's say, and the stories were just, we decided to write more concisely so that each scene actually brings something to the story. So I know, I know, I know, I I think another thing that's changed, we are more, we have more ease with Mm. writing the other person's character. Now we kind of understand it more as a story we write together. So if I have a very good idea for, Mm -hmm. I think, (laughs) a a line of dialogue that I think works for character, I'll just write a paragraph more. And usually it's accepted and there's no problem. Whereas whereas it used to be very Mm role-play, very like, this is my character, this is your character, and you don't get to interfere Mm -hmm. even as a suggestion. Mm -hmm. So I think that's changed a lot and it serves the stories. I think think we've grown so much thanks to that attitude, yeah. And we also uh, try to learn more about uh, the writing as a craft, both of us. So we usually, each one brings something to the table and we discuss it and we go to some uh, courses sometimes. And, you know, we don't, we never actually just take everything that we're taught of those courses, but you can think this through and improve and add to what you're already doing if it's something that you think it will just like will with work. A, just like with a craft book mm-hmm. you don't have to accept everything you're reading you might mm-hmm. disagree with some of it but you still might pick up a gold nugget here and there mm-hmm. that you didn't do before and we we keep adding to our uh, process. Sl- process of writing and i think it serves so it's the, the, the change has definitely been that we used to just yeah write Talk about faff about and write whatever came to our minds whereas now we really want the impact on the reader to be there I have a big excitement of not only writing the story I want to write but I always think wow the reader is going to be so shocked when they read Mm. this or like wow they're gonna not see this coming Mm. and like oh this action scene is going to be so exciting for them and when this thing happens they're gonna be so surprised I love that I feel Mm. like Sharing a story is more than just writing your own mm-hmm. magnum opus for yourself and look mm-hmm. at me, I'm so great. It's about providing an experience for someone mm-hmm. else. And I love to do that. I feel like I'm an entertainer that way. I love that perception there that you're an entertainer and you're yeah. providing mm-hmm. this experience mm-hmm. to someone else. And speaking of experiences, I'd love to hear from each of you about a book that's given you a great experience lately. What's something you would recommend to our listeners? I'll go first. I just read, I think, two months ago or something like that, a Western book, a contemporary one. After we finished the Western, I was still so entrenched in it. I was just looking for more Western stories and I actually found a contemporary. It's called Down Low by Parker St. John. And it's about this bull rider at the end of his career, coming back to his hometown where he lost his love. And now 10 years later, he gets to meet him again. And the guy is a sheriff and they get they have to reconcile over all the bad things that happened back then. But what I really loved about it is that it had this amazing sense of place. Like you could really feel that this author hasn't just lumped it in a random western town and oh yeah they're cowboys she wrote about the bull riding aspect in a way that i understood it i know nothing about it and now i feel like oh yeah i I know about it i know what's going on and i know what he's feeling and i know what uh, happens in a ring and a book with this kind of sense of space while also giving this very intense romance again that you know, span from their teenage years was a very, very uh, satisfying experience. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it was a good one. I read it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I'm currently reading a nonfiction book that it has a very long title, so I need to read it. It's Monsieur Veon is a Woman, A Tale of Political Intrigue and Sexual Masquerade by G- Gary Cates. And it's a biographical analysis of Chevalier Deon, who was a spy for the French courts in, in Russia, for example. And he, or they, they actually, they were cross-dressing, let's say, up until a point where Louis the Sixteenth told them to just wear women's clothes. They were also a very good fencer, and basically they were, they were great in all was those manly movie? pursuits. Was there a movie inspired um, by this? Possibly. There was an anime yeah. series, for sure. 
inspired by it. Oh, yeah. But this person lived the rest of their life as a, a woman. And they, when they died, it was discovered that physically they were male. And it's a fascinating life. Because the whole book is about how the society perceived them, how they perceive themselves, because there is uh, memoirs that have been translated. Letters, um, yeah. Yes, and letters. On, uh, how, and, and that's the social yes. aspect of yes. it, that you can it's learn so how those people really thought of it, not, yes. not just what you saw in the law. Mm. That, that's another interesting aspect of this kind of historical research. There is one thing that might be said in the law, mm. just like in the Western times, uh, it, there would be a law that, for example, would punish this or that activity. But if no one cared and no one mm. paid attention and people were permissive, it, not, it would be a completely yeah, different enforced. experience. Yeah. So it's a fascinating person from history. They were decorated with some medals for their service to the country and very fascinating life. And I'm currently reading this one and it's really good. So uh, if that that's sounds, of interest. <laughs> that sounds really fascinating. Thank you for sharing both of those books. I have to put those both on my TBR. <laughs> Very different. <laughs> yes. Very different. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about vampires and fantasy maybe coming 2022, somewhere in the future. We, yeah. You mentioned a new series that you're going to start later this year. Can you tease yeah. us more about that and what else might be coming in the remainder of 2021? Oh, yes, we're very excited about this one. And it's been a long be time coming. A seven book series. <laughs> but this one will be uh, each about a different couple. It's going to be a spin off of our Kings of Hell MC series, which was first published in 2017. That has five books. And it's a paranormal setting with a biker club that is in an old insane asylum on the grounds that of, of a place that's been there for centuries. And so there's all sorts of diabolical shenanigans and deals with the devil. And I won't go into spoilers of how it happens, but basically the spin-off series is about the seven children that happen at the end of that series. And the series will be called Seven Deadly Sons. And it will, because they are partially demonic, each of them will have a magical flaw based in one of the seven deadly sins. And it will be also a biker club series because they will be entrenched in that kind of reality and with, within that. So in a way, more like a superhero, this will be super disabilities. It will be mm -hmm. more like a horror because mm -hmm. of that. So each book they will have each each character has to deal with this magical that problem or or power that is actually mm. influencing them negatively even if it gives them some bonuses they might have to find a way to work around them and each based in one of the seven that listens so we're, mm. we're and it will also span many years that mm. uh, it's not going to be like seven of them and each of them having a romance every two months it's gonna be like At first start, times yeah, their lives. Uh, first starting uh when they're younger and then going all the way to the son that finds their partner at the later time mm -hmm. so yeah yeah we are very excited because we we've had this idea for a while <laughs> and the concepts change so many times, but I think now we have very good ideas for those books and we're yeah. super excited to write it finally. So after we finish Guns and Boys, we'll get to delve into that and we want to write them one after the other. So hopefully not to uh, spend the next 10 years writing them, but to actually <laughs> write one after the other and hopefully get the uh, attention of follow-up readers that way, yeah. Can't wait to see that start to come out. Yeah. What is the best way for everyone to keep up with you online to know when this new series comes out and any other news you've got? I think it's best to follow us on Facebook, to be honest. We have our Facebook group. It's called the American Playroom. And we have many active readers there who share all kinds of uh, discussions about the books. But uh, if you just want art. the new releases, yes. you can sign up to our newsletter. It's yes. on our website, kamerican.com. And there's a tag for newsletter mm -hmm. there. And I do, I do not write as often as I would like, but I <laughs> always write when there's a new release. Yes. So if someone just wants the new releases yes. and have no That's clutter, true. they'll always get an email if they sign up there. Mm. Yeah. yeah, but if, if someone wants more engagement, then the Facebook group is great. Perfect. We will put the links to the Facebook group, the newsletter, all oh, the books that we've talked about in our show notes so people can easily find all that. Kat and Agnes, it has been so amazing talking to both of you. I'm so glad and you were able to come to, to the show. Thank you so much.